This week on CrossFeed 150. Christmas carols, are they accurate? You got your church music in my comedy. Buy a church, buy a church. Did Jesus visit England? And your tax dollars and our government health care will come prayer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News, our 150th episode. I am Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio, near Cleveland. Good evening, America, and I am Dr. Jim Butler, pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, just outside Boston. So welcome, everyone. 150 episodes. Yep. Don't you people have anything better to do with your time? <laughs> we don't. That's why we're still here. <laughs> That's right. It's not we're preachers. We... we have nothing to do at this time of night. Yeah, we only work an hour a week. That's right. <laughs> but don't you people have something better to do? Whoa, Dale just went all pale on us. <laughs> well, you know, people always say I'm pretty bright, so. You know, I think I'm more of a ghost there, buddy. <laughs> so, to, sorry, it was kind of dark before. Okay, now so now, now he's got this. No, he's got this nice yellow glow there, nice gold. <laughs> Jaundiced. <laughs> oh, that too. But uh, so, no, I just finished working out, so uh, came home, got showered, got down here, and so I am ready to uh, uh, have a good time. And but I'm kind of up and at them, and just a lot of energy from working out. I walked 4.1 miles tonight, 60 minutes completely. Wow. Cool. I sat in a meeting for two hours. Fun meeting. Great people, you know. But uh, Aren't church meetings fun? They, I mean, you know, I mean, realistically, they're like, yeah, you've got stuff to discuss, but really the, the people are there because you're you're sharing in the joy of the gospel and and so even when you've got business to to discuss i know in some churches it gets real political and nasty and stuff like that that's not the case here you know and and sometimes we've got some serious things to talk about but you know it's like it was like 25 percent business and 75 percent just joking around and and you know just Mm -hmm. enjoying each other's company so um yeah, I, I I think we should stop calling them meetings. I don't have a better name for it though, but it's it's sort of like well the uh, you know the the board the social hour of education or something yeah. like that. Well, it's Don Dale. I, I I'm a person who likes to get things done, and, and and I'm really you know conscious of that. And sometimes sometimes that irritates me sitting around talking and, and stuff. I'm like, let's get to decisions. What do we need to do? Let's do it so we can go home. That's that's part of it. Um, but one of the ways I always evaluate a meeting at the end is, did we have fun? You know, at the end of this, you know, part of it is, did we stay on track? Did we get things accomplished? But the other thing is, did we have fun? Because if it's not fun, who wants to do it? Right, right. And keep in mind, you know, for the most part, in most of your uh, board meetings, stuff like that, these are volunteers. You know, these are people that are in it just because they love the church. They love, you know, um, they want to... It's 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 a passion for them, you know, to some degree, and so uh, so yeah. I mean, you should enjoy it. If you're not, you're doing it wrong. All right. Well, for you and I, it's work. You know, we're going to this meeting for them. This is added to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they've is... already done their eight eight nine hours today. This is on top of that. Yeah. Well, so, we've done that too, but <laughs> this you know, is... but still, this is our job. You know. Yeah. But uh, no, I try. I try to get as many meetings on Sunday afternoon right after church as I can. I that's my favorite time. I just said we're already here, man. We don't have to come back in, you know. Uh, and you know, for me, I, I know for you, it's you know that long walk across the parking lot. But for me, it's more like you know an eight, seven, or eight, ten miles in. So um, you know, I, I'm kind of with the people. Let's get it. You know, let's try and meet Sunday when we're already here. But. <laughs> I do my share of weeknights too. But, uh, well, Christmas is coming up in just three weeks. Can you believe that? Yep. Have you got your Christmas sermon written yet? I was, honestly, I was working on it, uh, during the meeting tonight. 
I had this really cool idea and I don't, I don't want to give it away or anything, but, uh, I, I'm, I'm doing something. I, I had this cool idea for, um, uh, for my, my first cruise, cause we've got two services. We got a candlelight service at 11 and then the sort of regular one. And, uh, so I, I, I came up with a neat idea and, um, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about it if, if I can pull it off. So. Yeah, we, uh, well, we have a service at three in the afternoon. And that was originally for people who don't like to drive, drive at night because it'll be done. But we found out families love it because this way they can go be with, you know, family who are plans they have in the evening or they want to get the kids in bed by seven. Um, so this is just, they just love this time. They can able to do, do everything. That became our more pop, most popular service. Yeah. Um, then we have one at six, which is, eh, you know, fairly well attended, but it's, not as well attended as one at three, which really surprised me because we originally thought, let's do this one at three in the afternoon for the people who don't like to drive at night. And then we have one Christmas Day. But I know what you're going to do for your Christmas. You're going to come up with, be the happy little star, just like all the great little Christmas carols that are out there. <laughs> and you're going to, you know, you're going to just, no, that's what you're going to, you're really going to sit there and say, all right, folks, these Christmas carols you sing, I want you to know. They're not accurate. And you're going to destroy Christmas for everybody. <laughs> yeah, because my heart's two sizes too small. <laughs> you look like a Grinch. Well, you're tall enough to be one anyway. Anyway, so uh, now that I know that you're a 6'4", man, I can make height jokes all day. That's great. So so there's this bishop out in um, England. His name is uh, the Right Reverend Nick Nicholas Baines. And uh, he um, is complaining that Christmas carols are nonsense that have turned the birth of Jesus into a fairy story. They are embarrassing and inaccurate. And nobody has ever known this before. Yeah, yeah, this is news. I, this I'm, is late breaking news here, folks. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, I know that probably once a year I have said on this show that we three kings of Orient are, there weren't three, they weren't kings, and they weren't from the Orient. <laughs> yeah, but he's not complaining about that one. He's complaining no, he's about not. a way in a manger. Yep. Yeah, that... uh that whole line about no crying he makes, you know, he's saying, now nah, hold on a minute here. He was a normal child and and uh, a normal child cries, and so we should expect that he cried too. Uh, well, although, to his credit, the Wittenberg door, the late lamented Wittenberg door many moons ago, like 20 years ago, when I was on Vicarage, had a contest of the worst Christmas the worst lyrics in any Christian song. And that line, no crying he makes, was one of them. So, right, Reverend, you can, and the Wittenberg door have given the people who wrote that, whoever it was, a greeny weenie. So feel good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and, yeah. you know, and that's the reality. And, and you know, if, if there were a way to change that line, you know, um, yeah, I'd like to, and you know, and and honestly, a lot of um, well, he he also complains about once in Royal David City, as Jesus is our childhood's pattern. He says, even though we know almost nothing of his childhood apart from one incident when he was twelve years old and being disobedient to his parents. <laughs> and, well, he wasn't being disobedient; he was being obedient to his father. Right. Although, I think we cut that that that. No, that it's it's out. still there. Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah, I, I I don't remember it. I I don't either. But I was when I I've got all of my Christmas services. I've got all of our services planned mm. through Epiphany. Yeah. So. <laughs> now I've just got a bunch of sermons to write. So you, I have no idea what we sing every week because I have a director of music who chooses all that, mm. and uh, he takes care of all that. I don't know if he listens, but Rob, you're the best. Believe me, because I hate picking on hymns. Well, I use the Lutheran Service Builder, and um, it it gives you a list of suggested hymns, and so you just go uh, that one, that one, that one, you know. Lutheran Service Builder only three hundred ninety five dollars from CPH right now. Order <laughs> yours today. 
Yeah, it's it's not as much for us. It's based on the size of your church. So I don't know how much it is, but it was they already had it here when I got here. You just have to pay ah, some okay. annual license fee. So that's called a revenue stream. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, I don't. I've got a you know absolutely wonderful director of music working on his master's degree at BU in uh, church music, and he does all. The, we decided when he came on a year ago, you're going to do all the picking of the music for me. And uh, only occasionally there was a every only there's like a Christmas. There's a Thanksgiving hymn I really like. And I, I said, I want this one from the sermon hymn. But generally, he does it all. anyway. But I mean, come on. I mean, you know, <clears throat> the reality is we know some of these hymns, these carols are not, you know, accurate. Um, there's that beautiful German carol, Stil, Stil, Stil. You know, which, you know, talks about the snow falling at, at Christmas. Yeah, mm-hmm. probably the original Christmas was what? In April, May? In, yeah, in in Israel, you know. <laughs> they don't get yeah. a lot of snow in Israel. Yeah, I don't get the whole lot in Israel anyway. You know, it's more the rainy season. You know, but somehow another rain, rain, rain <laughs> wouldn't really work, you know. <laughs> Dripping roofs, you know. Uh, stuff, but, uh, but still, I don't know. Uh, um. I, you know, because the important thing, he says, younger children need a sanitized version of the nativity. It may not always be challenging, but you need a certain amount of saccharin to draw people in. But you know what you need to do always, of course, is we need to go beyond the manger to the cross. That's our Christmas. Mm-hmm. Our Christmas is when our pack, our gift was not put under the tree, but on one. And he was unwrapped on Easter. Um, that's our Christmas. That's cool. And you yeah. guys can steal that one. I came up with that, that imagery back when I was in college. Feel free to rip it off. Any other preachers listening? It's, it's good. If you want more details, podcast at, uh, crossfeednews.com and I can, I can, you know, kind of highlight some other pictures and imagery that I use that. But yeah, that's, that's a, that's an image I like in this image of the cross being a Christmas tree and it's cool and it's free. You can steal it from me. Don't even need to give me credit. Um, but speaking of inaccurate songs, <laughs> there is that wonderful hymn used in that absolutely great movie, Chariots of Fire, called Jerusalem. And which asks the question, did Jesus walk in England? And the answer to that is? Um, according to Dr. Gordon Strachan, uh, in his new film, And Did Those Feet, yes. Or, it's plausible. It's like it's, it's like plausible. a Mythbusters episode. <laughs> Did he? Well, it's plausible. <laughs> you know. Um, First, of course, uh, as always, we've got those quote, mystery years in time he was 12 to 30, and he had plenty of time to do that journey. <laughs> he had time? But, <laughs> well, like, I mean, okay, here's your, here's your scientific study, okay, that's, you know, funded by ho- however many dollars. How long would it take to walk from Nazareth to England and back? Well... I think we should apply for stimulus funds to figure that one out. <laughs> well, we also have to figure out what's the average um, walking on water speed. So, <laughs> oh, he must have had to have a boat because he didn't perform any miracles um, until the wedding of Cana. So, um, now the 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 the, the uh, 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 you know Nag Hammadi gospels, the Gnostic gospels said he did too. Yeah. And I think this is just as accurate as any of those Gnostic Gospels. I think you're probably right. <laughs> so, yeah, he had plenty of time to do the journey um, because little no- was known about his life before the age of 30. All right, that's right. It wouldn't take 30 years <laughs> to get to, to England and back. The question is, uh, number one, would he have had the, the, the financial means to get there? You know, And he says yes. Because he went with his uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, who was coming to look for tin. Now, I didn't know Joseph was his uncle, first of all. <laughs> yeah, That's neither did I. To me. And I didn't know he was into tin. This is madness. 
Well, you and know. why? Why did he come to England? To further his education under the, the Druids. Druids. <laughs> when will this insanity end? But Jesus yep. died on a tree. So <laughs> there. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there you go. Knock on wood. Here it is, folks. <laughs> You're crazy. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> well, and actually with the Passover thing, um, it was, it, what, it would have been a full moon, which is, uh, that's a sort of tied in with the whole Druid thing, too. So, uh, yeah, he went there to meet the Druids and share his wisdom and gain theirs. Because, Yeah. Yeah. This is Jesus as tree hugger. <laughs> All right, I guess. Um, but my favorite one is here is St. Augustine wrote to the Pope to say he discovered a church in Glastonbury built by the followers of Jesus. But St. Gildas said that it was built by Jesus himself. It's a very, very ancient church, which went back to perhaps A.D. 37. Okay. St. Gildas lived in the 6th century, only 500 years after Jesus. Mm-hmm. Okay, so think, folks, this is twice as long as, you know, America's been around. So in another 300 years, are you really going to trust what somebody said about Washington? Are you going to look at the original stuff, what it says about Washington, you know? Well, not only that, now think, this is a very ancient church that went back perhaps to A.D. 37, and Jesus helped to build it when he was there as a child, right? Jesus died and rose again a d thirty thirty three something like that so well, if you take if you if you take the accuracy of of the you know it's really probably eighty twenty nine to thirty yeah uh because the calendar's off right right but, so, so yeah I, it's just so so seven years after he ascended into heaven, <laughs> Jesus came back down to help them build this church <laughs> right, so folks, here it is, okay, Jesus did not go to England, Jesus did not go to India. Jesus did not go to China. And the Mormons, to the contrary, Jesus did not come to America. You know, okay? I, a couple of weeks ago when I was when I was talking to some Mormons, it, it, it kind of hit them that um, because they've see, there's this um, the Mayans who we've been hearing a lot about because the whole 2012 thing um, they had. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. It wasn't the Mayans. It was the Aztecs that had, no, it was anyway. Um. Yeah, it was the Mayans. Who did, who did Cortez wipe out? Uh, the Mexicans, the Aztecs. Yeah, the Aztecs. Okay. The Aztecs had a myth of this god called Quetzalcoatl. And they described him as a bearded white man that taught them how to live. And then he went away and said, I'm going to come back. All right. So, which is why when Cortez came, they thought he was Quetzalcoatl and, and they just basically bowed down to him and he killed him. But, um, and, you know, they were totally caught off guard because they thought he was their God who had come back to them. All right. So the Mormons kind of latch onto this and say, look, the, who is this bearded white man that, that came, um, to, to teach them years and years ago? It was Jesus. Okay. Here's the problem. Jesus isn't white. <laughs> In fact, his skin would have probably been about the same color as the Aztecs, which actually would have worked well with Mormon theology, um, given that they consider the um, American Indians to be the lost tribes of of Israel. But yeah. um, you can't you can't tie it in with the bearded white man thing, you know, unless yeah. you believe the, the uh, Renaissance art. <laughs> Right. But there is a, a, a legend, though, that Jesus went to, did go to England, and it is popularized in the, with the hymn Jerusalem, uh, which is based on a poem written by William Blake, and um, the uh, movie Chariots of Fire, that wonderful hymn at the end, uh, that's the hymn Jerusalem, that some people even argue should be the national anthem of England. Um, <clears throat> yeah, some actually do argue that. Um uh, and, him about, uh, a, about a city in another country. <laughs> no, no, because this was supposed to be England's supposed to be the New Jerusalem and stuff. Oh, uh, okay. But it, it really is. But I don't know if the, I don't know if the right Reverend Reigns has, has commented on that. That might be a better <laughs> one to ask. 
Now, okay, D- Dale and I obviously are laughing here a whole lot. We're having just a good old time on this, our 150th episode. We even should start a comedy club. There you go. Yeah, but, you know, if we did, we'd probably get drowned out by some of those church people. Probably. <laughs> probably. So there is this comedy club in Austin, Texas. The Cap City Comedy Club. And right next door, a church opened up. And they are having a problem on Wednesday nights. Because the, the, the music from the church is bleeding through the walls. <laughs> Love that imagery. <laughs> uh, and maybe some of the preaching, too, if I understood this right. Yeah. Two is establishments, uh, or the bleeding through the wall, the two establishments share. So it's it's like in the same building, not like next door, you know, with space separating. Um, and distracting from the joke-telling heathens that normally perform at the time. Why is that funny? So uh, the the church is, it says the church has taken steps to reduce the noise. They cut off the church, the church band's music early and refrain from using microphones during the service in question. Uh, even so, the property manager stated disrupting other tenants is a violation of the lease and has asked the church to provide a move-out date. So the church is... I'll go, uh, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go with, I'll go. ...holding a Jokes Against Jesus protest outside the club during some of the upcoming Saturday night shows. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> first off, you got to give the church credit. They're trying to meet them halfway. They're cut down the sound. They're trying to get the, you know, that. But, you know, I, you know, it, you know, maybe the property manager needs to give thicker walls. I, you know, comedy clubs are usually pretty loud. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I'm thinking that, okay, if I was a comic and I was going to be, you know, at this place, and especially since this is going to be in the news there, um, you know, you hear about it and, okay, we'll just come up with some good church jokes so that when yep. you start hearing the music, you go, oh, yeah, and, you know, I know the church that was so loud or, you know, whatever, and 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 just work with it. I mean, this, you're a comedian. That's your job. So, I don't know. At, at the same time, I I don't know if the this protest against the club is really in the church's best interest either. No, I don't think the protest is a good idea at all. I think they should just drop the protest and move on. Um, I really think it's it's a, a bad idea. But I, I but I think the property manager is wrong in saying you guys need to move out then. You know, the property manager needs to sit back and say, okay, how can we work this out? What can right. we do? Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, uh, can you not have the band at all on Wednesday nights? Can you do something different than a Wednesday night service? Inconceivable. I mean, because, um, you know, uh, um, you know, I'm just not sure that his answer was the right answer here. No, no, it seems kind of reactionary, especially since they, you know, they made some changes. You know, he could have gone back to him and said, it's not enough. Need to, you know, come up with some other stuff. And again, it's a very short story. We don't have both sides of it and, right. you know, and all that kind of thing. So we're, we're sort of, um, you know, by necessity to talk about this have to kind of jump to conclusions a little bit about different things or just have to sort of say, well, look at the, the, the perspectives of, of the different people and try right. to understand where each of them is coming from. All right. I think I've been happier if it said that the property manager is trying to help the church find another place to go. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that would make me a lot more comfortable with this rather than say, OK, I just need a date when you're going to leave. Um, I think if they, you know, have a date, said, look, we've got a problem with the com- comedy club. They were here first. You know, they're a longer, you know, term tenant. Uh, mm-hmm. Can I help you find someplace else to go? Right. Yeah. You know, it, I, I mean, know. it's in Austin, so there's got to be, it, it, you know, I'm, it, it kind of sounds like it's like a storefront or something like that. And, right. Um, so there's got to be other empty storefronts that they could go to. Um, it's a bit of a hassle, you know, to when you're a church. They haven't been there all that long, but when you're trying to sort of get the ball rolling um, and uh, 
and obviously they're they're pretty small if if they can fit into a like a storefront kind of thing. And right. uh, but you can you can advertise lost or lease. This is what we're moving to. Um, you can do a lot of things. I, I I think that you know if they were just going to say okay, can we help you find? I mean, come on, your property management company. You know, the guys got to be. It's apparently a property management company. They've got to have other properties that they can say, you know, let's let's move you into that'll be comparable. Right, right, yeah. Because I mean, realistically, otherwise they're going to go to some other place with some other property management company, and all of a sudden you'll lose your rent. Yeah. You know? So I, I was talking to one of our pastors out here, and he's talking about a, a grocery store that got out of business. And so he was looking at, you know, I wonder about planning a church in that grocery store. I was right next to a liquor store. And um, a property management company would not even return his calls. Really? Really. Still, it's still vacant, but they won't. Re- when, they, uh, when he says, hi, I'm from XYZ Lutheran Church, they won't return his calls. And it's still vacant. Yeah, because, so. you know, and the thing is, a, for a Lutheran church plant next to a liquor store, it would probably drum up business for the liquor store. <laughs> I mean, really. Or, you know what this church really should do in Austin, Texas? They should move to Iowa. <laughs> Guys, if you're There's an opening. <laughs> we have a church for you to move into. Go home. Go. This is actually not too far. Um, Lamont was, um, it was, we'll put it this way. Um, where I was in Iowa uh, before I came here, the radio station that we listened to, um, also when they would list off the various cities that were within their range, they included Lamont. So, I mean, it was a stone's throw away from where I was. I, I've got a, a pretty good idea where it is. Okay, um, Dale, am I moving on mine? Yep. Okay, because you're not on mine. Really? Really. Hmm. Okay, well, just in case, we better. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're back. You're back. You're moving now. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um. So anyway, in Lamont, there was a church called Holy Rosary Catholic Church. That's original. And a guy by the name of what? I said, that's original. Yeah. And one of the members there, a guy by the name of Steve Steins, could not stand to see it close. He had been married there. His children were baptized there. And so he bought the building. At least he didn't buy the farm. Um, it says three years later, the place still smells like incense. But he, despite occasional rentals for events, it says owning the building is becoming a drain. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, you yeah, he wants to give it back to the archdiocese if they'd reopen it. But they're not going to reopen it because it'd be a drain for them. Yeah. <laughs> That's why they closed it in the first place. So, right. yeah, he, he offered to give it back. Well, it was already paid for. It's not like they were um, – it's not like the problem was that they could, couldn't make payments on it. They couldn't afford to put a priest in there. Right, they, well, they or they could afford to keep the upkeep of the building. I mean, you know, you know as well as I do, churches are you know expensive to heat uh, during the winter time. Yeah, oh yeah, and this wouldn't be, of course, this one being ceilings. Em- uh, I remember when there was this one one pat one priest I was talking to, and oh, they had the coolest looking church. I just love to look at it. Um, it was just, it was in the round and it had this raised middle part and it was really cool. And I was over the priest one time talking to him and he looked at me and he said, do you have any idea how much heat escapes up there and what that costs us to heat every winter? And I uh, he's like, it's horrible. It looks great. But I said, I'd never do it now. <clears throat> you know, if I was building this building today, that wouldn't be there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, I mean, we have, we have ceiling fans in our Sanctuary, and we don't have a very high ceiling um, in comparison to most of these, you know, older churches because um, this church was built in the '60s. And um, but but we we only use our ceiling fans in the winter time to pull the heat down. Um, yep. So it was, it, yeah. I mean, that, that that's just the reality. But you know. I, one thing with this article that, that really got me thinking is 
the way, and I'm not, I'm not really, you know, kind of picking on this guy at all, but we as Christians in general tend to tie our identity as Christians to a building. Mm -hmm. You know, we say, I'm going to church. I'm going over, you know, even, even here where I'm a pastor and I live in a parsonage that say, I'm going over to the church. All right. But in the, in the, um, in the Bible, the word that is usually translated church is the assembly. It's the people. And the, you know, the building is just the place where the people assemble. But I, I think that we as, as Christians need to stop looking at the, at our identity, getting it from a building. Um, I actually, um, on this past Sunday, preached a little bit on this topic, and I, I um, used a, a Stephen Wright uh, comedian. Speaking of comedians, um, he did this bit about I went home and put my key in the door and and turned the turned the knob and and or turned the key and the house started up and I realized that I, it was my car key instead of my house key and so I took it for a drive out on the highway. And, um, and so, uh, I said, I said, you know, we as a church, if, if you're going to see your, um, your, your, if you're going to tie your Christian identity to a building, then take it for a drive out on the highway, you know, to get out into the community with your church because it's not the, the people. And, and, and so often we, we also, tie our identity to the worship service and the worship service is just, you know, it's probably the most common place where Christians assemble. Right. But it really shouldn't be the sort of defining place. I know a lot of people see it that way, but really uh, the defining place that we assemble, um, at least, you know, if, if not, you know, at, le at least equivalent is we're we're out in the community, uh, whether collectively or individually. You know, just living out our Christian lives, because yeah, you know, gathering around Word and Sacrament is really important, um, and and that's where we you know we hear the gospel. And uh, but at the same time, if if you define your faith by what you do for an hour or so a week then you're kind of missing the point. You're really, I mean, you're kind of losing out on a lot of opportunities and, and just missing the whole missional emphasis. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. So, um, I just, you know, maybe it was just because I had just preached on that topic that this kind of caught my attention that he just couldn't stand to let this building go. And, um... But I mean, you know, at the same time, they're beautiful old buildings and stuff like that, and and I can understand being attached to, uh, to the building, and and just like a sometimes a family has a hard time when they have to move away from a house where all the kids grew up, and there's the markings on the walls, and you know, a lot of memories tied into it, and that, um, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to be stuck with this building, but uh, yeah, the other thing is Jesus, and he wasn't speaking literally here, but you know, he said, if you're going to build a house, make sure you can afford it before you start building, <laughs> you know, here, that's literally true. <laughs> he, he, before you buy this thing, make sure that you can afford to keep it up. Yep. Which is kind of sad. <clears throat> of course. Now, if they got money, you know, if they had people come in for prayer, for healing, and they got paid for it, he could probably keep the building. There you go. And now, do I believe in prayer and healing? Yes, I do. I mean, I pray for people to be healed. I go to visit people in the hospital. I pray that they be healed. Um, I am convinced that we could probably do a lot more healing if we were really, really, you know, if we got people who really to pray for people who are sick and really prayed for them, I believe we could, you know, do some really cool stuff in the area of healing. I really do. I believe that. But... Um, <clears throat> the um, 
there is this the Christian Scientists, which are headquartered here in Boston. Um, you can go downtown, see the First Church of Christ Scientists downtown. Um, want to get reimbursed by the government for prayers as part of. By the way, talk about oxymorons. They're not Christian and they're not science. Okay, so let's just you know like, yeah. talk about unreal things, inaccurate titles. Christian science is the, the un, you know, it's not Christian, it's not science, it's neither one. Um, Christian science actually is a weird philosophy that says that, uh, uh, and it's based in New Thought, the New, the new Thought movement, um, and basically it says that sickness, pain, illness. None of that really exists. That's all in your mind. Losing his mind. And I'm reaping all the benefits. So, which is why they don't use normal, um, you know, medicine. Right. Because you can't treat something that doesn't really exist. (laughs) Right. So when I was at uh, the Lutheran High School, my uh, year after we got married, and I was the janitor there, and the, the high school team, the football team was getting ready, ready to play Principia, which was a Christian science residential school. I said, go ahead and kill them, guys. Pain doesn't really exist. <laughs> <laughs> and then they get up, they go, oh, go look at them say, it's all in your head. Remember that. You know, because, you know, that's, the, that's, the, that's their theology. So, so they call it spiritual health care. And, and I love this. All right, you go to one of these, these uh, leaders of, of the church, and they will, um, because they have to, to go and have their, the leader, which be sort of like a pastor, um, to have them pray for you, it's like 20 to $40. Well, that's what they want. They want... The, the insurers to reimburse them twenty to forty dollars. Yes, as part of this, the the proposed health care legislation. Okay, now I, here's here's the question I'm wondering: Is this any stranger? Okay, first off, I'm against this. Okay, the, let me put it, put it real honestly with you. But uh, part of me is wondering: Is this any weirder than like acupuncture? Don't torture yourself. That's my job. Well, you know, I. I mean, that's a good question. Now, although, at least with acupuncture, there's um, there's a possibility that there's some science behind it. I mean, it's it's definitely rooted in, in spiritism and, and stuff like that. Um, and, and I saw a recent study where they used, um, it was a, a sort of blind study where uh, people that were treated for acupuncture, some of them, they just poked their back with toothpicks instead. And uh, they got the exact same results. So, um, you know, so basically they showed that it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty much placebo. Um, but, uh, you know, the other people would argue, well, no, it was, it's because you're, you're hitting those specific points or, you know, or whatever. You know, toothpicks, they didn't leave splinters. Uh, no, no, they didn't, work. They didn't on, pierce them with them. They just, like oh. took the toothpick and went poke, you know. Oh, okay. okay so they okay. thought they were getting a needle stuck in them, but they really weren't. No, that would hurt like crazy to have a toothpick stuck in you. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering there. Okay, okay. But anyway, so um, you know, all right, and 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 our now formerly many years junior, now senior senator John Kerry, you get promoted when someone dies. Okay, that's you know he, sh- you know. He, you know he was the you know Star Trek mirror universe guy. You get, you only get ahead when the other guy dies. So you know, um, he is reporting for duty and wants this to go through. John, you're Catholic. Are you gonna? You want this to go through? All the priests are gonna say we want to get paid too. Yeah, yeah. You want to come to? Yeah, you want to come to confession? Absolute. You you know? Oh, you want? Uh, I, I want to be reimbursed for when you come and confess your sins. You want to? Um, well, I, not that, but don't you go to the hospital and pray for people? Oh well, yeah, I do. I do too. If they're getting prayed for, paid for their prayers at twenty to forty bucks a pop, I want to get paid for my prayers twenty forty to bucks a pop. 
Yeah, yeah. I guarantee you, I will get out there. I will visit my people every day. I will visit them every hour. <laughs> yeah, I'll be praying all day long. <laughs> I will be calling those hospitals every day. Forget the HIPAA laws, folks. I'll give you kickbacks. You let me know who's there for these prayers. Oh, man, can you imagine, like, hospital chaplains? Man, they'd really be raking it in. Yeah, I mean, you know, but I figured, you know. Because can you imagine that show? I get up? 10 people a day? That's two to 400 bucks a day. That's hey, You think about that? You you go to, um, you, you get your bill after when you leave the hospital and, and you're looking at it and you, you see, you know, prayer fee, you know, oh, the chaplain stopped in. So here's the, here's the fee for that, you know. Right. Um, now, Okay, it's interesting to me that the person she talked, they talked to about being against us is our good friend Annie Gaylor from the Freedom from Religion Foundation. It's not very often I think Dale and I are on the same side as the Freedom of America, really. I think we're going to talk just about anybody in mainline churches here, and we're all going to sit there and say, this is a really bad idea. Of course, who's his co-sponsor, Orrin Hatch? The Mormon! Yeah, Orrin Hatch says that uh, the provision would ensure that health care reform law does not discriminate against any religion. Um, yeah, and uh, it would probably kill the bill, too, if people found out that the money was going to pay for this. And Orrin Hatch, being a Republican, um, probably doesn't like the bill anyway. <laughs> and so, like, yeah, sure, put that in there. <laughs> what other ridiculous say, things can we get in Where did you draw the line? Huh? If you if you reimburse the Christian scientists, okay, you were seriously, you almost got to go with the, with the regular hospital chaplain. What about the voodoo practitioner? Mm-hmm. What about the witch doctor? And am an am you know, I mean, at what point can you sit there and say, no, we're not covering this person? You can't do it. You can't do it under the First Amendment. Uh, and if you're gonna, you know, I mean, when Dale and I go to go to hospitals to pray and we do it all the time um it's with understanding that prayer does work it does have effect but that god works through means and god works through the medication yeah right and so we pray for the doctors the nurses that the medicines that the people take we thank god for the miracles of medicine that we have how you like that alliteration, folks? Uh, you know, and, you know, we, we, we think after these medical miracles that we have in the 21st century, uh, and, and, and the healing arts. Yeah, we pray that the, I was including my prayers, pray for the doctors and nurses that God would give them the skills and abilities to, uh, be able to, to do, to provide for them and, and, and do what needs to be done and that the, they'd be able to find, uh, what the problem is and, and have the knowledge how to treat it. Um, right. but and in then this we pray case, that God would give them the the patient and their family's faith to trust that God's going to take care of them, and you know, and 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 it's okay. I mean, I I pray that if um, you know if God wants to use a miracle, He will, and He can, and sometimes He does, but um, you know He doesn't promise to, and so uh, so if if we pray for a miracle, a miracle, we have to say if it be Your will. Um, and trusting God that hasn't God ever promised us a rose garden, mm-hmm. but you know, I mean, these okay, so I'll, okay, podcast crossfeednews.com. Who sang that song? I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. Dale, you can't say it. This is this is this is audience participation for this, our 150th episode. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that has got to be the lamest way. <laughs> Hey, I, I, I'm having a good time up here in Boston. Tonight. Especially but the people reality is, Google I mean, it. These people, Christian scientists, that there's no such thing, uh, you know, as illness that, you know, it's all in your mind. Medicine doesn't really work. Nothing works. And so, uh, um, you know, and I, it's absolutely, you know, they call it spiritual health care. It's absolutely nothing except quackery. Uh, and if we're going to, and if the, you know, I'm not in favor of nationalized health care to begin with. Though I, a part of me, though, looks at the, you know, the expensive that we're spending on it and just going, you know, somebody, we got to do something somewhere along the line. I'm not sure 
you know, the current plans are it, but we got to do something. But we definitely cannot have this kind of nonsense as a part of it. No. And, you know, and the thing is, yeah, we're saying this and we could theoretically benefit from it if they actually did it. I mean, because we we could if say, well, no, hold on a minute. You're paying them to pray. You got to pay us to pray, too. You know, we could really get rich off of this, but it's not right. <laughs> you know? And uh, so, no, absolutely not. <laughs> For that matter, you know, I was thinking, though, if your church, you know, needs a new roof or something like that, all you could do is get together and have a prayer vigil for somebody in the hospital. Everybody from the church comes and prays. Oh, let's say 20 bucks for you, 20 bucks for you. <laughs> I mean, it's just right, right open. But the, but the Christian scientists would love it because they're going broke. Um, you know, and they're, 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 they're closing down, uh, whatever it is they have right and left. And, um, um, soon they'll just be back there in Boston again. Senator Kerry, figure it out, buddy. You're not reporting for duty um, <clears throat> in this one. So, uh, man, what maybe you guys disagree. Around Me- Boston. What? what? Nut jobs, those people around Boston, man. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. I'm the chief of them. Because, yeah, and, those, you know, those so, who have been watching or listening for 150 episodes, they know that already. That's <laughs> right. Uh, although they do have a beautiful collection of Bible manuscripts and Bibles at the first uh, at, at the Christian Science Church, right across the right in that area, they have a beautiful collection there uh, to go see, uh, which I've never done, but I've read about it. So, uh, but hey, folks, uh, uh, maybe you guys disagree. Maybe you think no, 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 no. Healthcare uh, should cover. These prayers and stuff. Give us your opinion. Uh, the podcast at crossfeednews.com. Uh, in all seriousness, folks, you know, there's only one reason Dale and I have done this for 150 episodes, and that is because you take the time to listen. And uh, we really do thank you for taking the time to watch, to listen, to share your lives with us. It really does mean a lot to us. Yeah, Both yeah we of- love hearing from you. So, yeah, please send us a note. Uh, post a comment up on YouTube or wherever you're watching this. Um, we get those too. And, um, you know, even if it's just, uh, Hey guys, congratulations. You know, we just like to know that there's people out there actually listening. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if congratulations is in order cause we're just that stubborn that we keep doing it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, or just we, that stupid. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't send us a note and say, nobody's watching or listening. Cause you know, you wouldn't know that unless you were watching or listening. So well, that's right. So no news this week, no comments, nothing else to share because we haven't gotten any email. But if you give us some, we will send it to you. So God give you all just an absolutely wonderful week in his grace as we hit the second week of Advent. Um, and then as uh, we are just three weeks, three weeks today from or tomorrow from Christmas. Yep. Go get your shopping done. <laughs> Yeah, see if you can find a Juju pet. Our kids want those. Yeah. I have no idea what that meant. You can't find them around here or anywhere else. So. Anything about them? If it's not online, we're not getting it this year. So, folks, take care. God bless. And we'll see you next week. Good night, everybody. God bless. <laughs>